The tenant is responsible for the property taxes, the insurance, and they maintain the space. I'm responsible to protect the roof and keep the space watertight. So if there's water leaking, something's seeping through the floor or something, that's on me. If there's a leak in the roof, he's calling me. If you know what you're looking for in commercial, you can make a killing, but you have to know what to look for. Well, welcome to the podcast, Nolan Sandburn. Appreciate you taking time to uh, hang out. Um, so we met through Jordan, who was previously on the podcast, um, good buddies of yours. And I think before that, we had actually met at kind of like an investor meetup at Tzatziki's like years ago. And we had a brief conversation. I totally remember that. I was like, this guy is, uh, we were talking about like, market and what you kind of had acquired in different investments. I was like, this guy's a player. And I wanted to follow up with you and I think just never made the connection and then circle back. Now you're in the podcast. So <laughs> sometimes things can fall through the cracks. You know how that goes. But yeah, I, I've been uh, working with Jordan Miles for maybe six or seven months now. And of course, you and I going back to uh, the Tzatziki at the Colonnade a couple of years back. But yeah, it's it's there's it's been a, a lot of movement since you and I kind of first connected up, but uh, really excited about where things are now and kind of where things are going into the new year and beyond. That's awesome. So when we had talked at Tzatziki's, you had talked about kind of you were, I think, in the middle of dispoing some of your stuff in Indiana and still had some stuff here and we're kind of, I think you weren't fully transitioned. So talk me through, let's just start back to um, your kind of origins of starting to invest when you started to acquire. You were you used to play baseball for the White Sox organization, mm -hmm. correct? And you would go out on weekends or times that you weren't playing ball and go look for properties and then fly to your next like location. So talk me through kind of how you built your first portfolio and, you know, started that whole process. I, I look back and I think about like that, that just seemed like such a kamikaze move, like trying to do, <laughs> you know, real estate and playing professional baseball. But I would, uh, yeah, so I read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, same as you, same as everybody on you know, bigger pockets forums. And so I was like, whoa, this is way different than how I was raised to go and trade your time for money and work really hard and do the whole thing. So I was fortunate to, I was playing professional baseball with the Chicago White Sox and their, you know, minor league organization and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad while I was playing. And again, like I said, just totally opened up my mind to thinking differently than what maybe I was, you know, priorly doing. So in the off season in 2016, I started buying all my dad, all of his friends, coffee and lunches, and just trying to figure out like what I had to do to get into this game. Cause that was this passive income thing was new to me. So s similar to everybody, like I'm, my story is no different. And so started buying these guys, you know, lunches and coffees and a couple beers. And basically I got a, a, a sweet little base hit deal from one of my dad's friends. I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm unloading my last couple of houses. You can buy them from me. Went to the bank and the bank's like, you don't have any income because you make like 5,500 bucks a year in the miners. <laughs> so I kind of, it was kind of like a handshake deal with this bank. And we, you know, I bought my first rental property, but first properties, I guess. Well, kind of as time went on, you know, the next season I ended up getting released by the White Sox. I got picked up by the Nationals. I was, you know, waking up early and, and studying these markets and doing all the things that I thought was the right move. And at the time it was, there was, to answer your question though, I would, uh, I mean, it's crazy. I would, I would, I hired a property manager in Indiana and on the off days that we'd have, I'd play baseball every night at 7.05, we'd have our, our game times. And then on the off days, I would take the 6 a.m. flight from, at the time I was in Potomac, Maryland. I'd take, I'd go to fly, I'd drive to DC. I'd take the flight to Indianapolis. I'd rent a car for the day. I'd go look at 30 or 40 houses, put offers on 20 of them. And then I'd f drive back to Indianapolis and fly back to DC on like the red eye. And then wow. I'd get on the bus at like 7.30 and we'd go drive to some city you've never heard of and go play that night. And I did that probably like four times that summer. Wow. And uh, it's it's crazy to look back and think about that. But I think that's one thing that, like you mentioned before, the tenacity thing, it's like doing things that nobody else is willing to do. And that's kind of what allows you to get a step up and, and take a step forward in kind of your investing career, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it's, you know, on this podcast, we've talked a lot about the first one's the hardest. Oh, yeah. And it's the scariest. But the journey in general of being an entrepreneur, being an investor, um, requires 
some season, not all season, but some season of hyper focus and just all in, I'm going to get this thing done. And that early season for most people, I think, like refines them that projects the rest of their, you know, investing career and kind of gives you like that framework of like, I'm going to be successful in this because you kind of cut your teeth on what what is a difficult you know, first step or two steps, you know? Well, and another piece on that too is when I was at the ballpark every day, you know, baseball is like, it's, it's a, if you watch it on television, it's a pretty passive game. There's a lot of kind of standing around. There's a lot of, uh, you know, popcorns in the seats, that kind of thing. There's not a, there's the action only happens like really quick. And so during the day we'd get to the ballpark at, you know, one thirty. our batting practice started at three o'clock and we played at seven. So there's a lot of downtime. And so, a lot of guys, this is not a knock on anybody, but it was a lot of video games. It was a lot of scrolling. It was a lot of watching television, a lot of ping pong, you know, that kind of thing. And I, after I read that book, it, it kind of, like you said, it kind of flipped a switch in my mind. And I was like, I just don't, I just don't know if I want to be one of these guys. I don't know if I want to be a, a hangout guy. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of made it, made a decision that summer that I, I, you know, like I said, the, the the financial freedom that they talk about, the passive income, exceeding monthly expenses, like I was going to be that guy. And like you said, I just became so laser focused and determined on it. Believe it or not, I actually somehow had this compartmentalization where I, when I was on the mound, I could zone in on what I was doing and focus exactly on my goal. But then when it was, you know, the off time and, and the game was over, I was able to kind of float back down to earth and focus on being this, you know, real estate investor, you know, that everybody talks about. They're trying to be, you know, the passive income thing. So that's kind of, that's kind of, um, I just didn't want to be like everybody else. And when I read that book, it, it kind of like got me over the hump to, to really going all in. That's awesome. Okay. So you're going out, you're, you're looking at properties and you obviously start to build a portfolio. Where'd you land, um, you know, at the end of that journey of building stuff in in Indi- in Indianapolis or no Como- Kokomo Kokomo yeah, it's like an yeah. hour north. Yeah, yeah. So, where did you land? Like, would you final door count? Where were you at? Yeah. So, so bought my first three from a guy, and then you know, a lot of it was with some with some creative financing. You know, you discover subject to investing, owner financing. You know, all the things that they talk about in the forums. So I got up to that summer before 2017, I had like 12 houses, I think. And then by the end of the year, I had like 25. And then I got to a point where then I bought a I bought a 22 unit apartment building with no money. So I had 55 units at one point yeah. in Kokomo, Indiana, which That's amazing. isn't like a lot, but it's not a little. And yeah. you discover, I discovered really quickly the the management side like my the the story that I think everybody if as you are scaling if you're watching you you buy you you everyone's trying to find ways to spend their time how they want that's really the 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 main desire of everyone that's why they most of the people get into real estate is because they discover passive income and passive income over the cost of their life their lifestyle is freedom so they can wake up doing what they want and they figure out, okay, what if I bought like three houses? What would that look like? And they buy three houses and it's like, man, for like six or eight months, you're like, this is really cool. I'm earning passive income. This is exactly what they talked about. Yeah. And then an AC blows out and it's like 6,500 <laughs> bucks later. Like, dang, there goes all that cash flow. And so then you think in your head, okay, well, if that AC is going to go out, it's more likely than not going to go out on another one in the future because they just put a new one in here. So I'm, you know, you're playing this, yeah. you're shuffling the deck. But if I just added a couple more, it would allow me to, you know, mitigate that risk of having something blow out or losing a tenant or whatever. So then you go and add a couple more, whether it's creatively or bank debt or cash or whatever, you get to like seven or eight of them. And then it's, you know, you get that six month, you know, high of, man, this is really going well. And then an HVAC blows. And then an HVAC <laughs> blows out or something, something goes sideways again. And then you discover like, okay, now I got to manage like eight to 10 tenants now and I'm doing it all myself. It's somehow starting to take away from my W two or ten ninety nine. That's starting to lose a little, lose a little steam. So you're like, okay, I've got enough cash flow now to hire a third party or a manager. And then you're like, now I'm really I'm able to work on my business, not in my business, because I got a manager handling all this stuff. And you got this cash flow, you get that high again, 
and you're starting to scale again. And I, it, this is my story. I basically discovered, I got to about 30 of these things and I thought I was like on, I was like number one. I was like, this is so cool. I'm making like 12,000 a month of passive income, you know, whatever. Right. And then I started to see in my accounts that I started to get a little spooked that maybe my manager might have been skimming off the top. And so I was like, is this guy like stealing from me? And I was trying to build this unit count of all these doors because that's what they tell you to do. Mm -hmm. And I just found out that like this is not what I'm this is not what I was like. This is not the bought of goods I was sold. I was thought it was like this passive financial freedom. It ends up being me on the phone with the property manager four hours a week, taken away from my W-2, taken away from my family. Right. And you just find out you create a whole second job and you're not happy because yeah. your tenants, your your tenants think that you're this greedy landlord mustache guy from Monopoly, you know? <laughs> and it just like turned you into this crazy guy. And yeah, so yeah. that was my experience. And thankfully, you know, things have moved forward. I think yeah, I would agree there's different asset classes that that provide different experiences for certain types of clients and you're right like on some of the lower end or some of some of the areas where your margins are tighter um, you have to be a little bit more involved in the process because the margins are tighter and the cash flow is you know tougher and the goal is you know especially on the in my opinion on the low end stuff to have tenants that are there for five ten years because that's when you really start to generate serious money from it because the turns are what will just eat your cash alive oh um, but if you can find a long-term tenant so on the flip side of class properties right you have a class and it is a very rare situation that someone in an a class property is going to stay for 10 years very rare. Very rare. But the flips and the turns on when the tenants move in and out are a lot cheaper because they don't tear up the properties as much. So, you know, that's what I found with my properties because I have some A-class stuff and I have some C-class stuff and I have stuff in the middle. And they all just kind of provide a different experience for the investor and you're right. Sometimes when it rains, it pours. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, it, it that goes... coffer goes. <laughs> that that liquidity goes down pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, and and I will admit though. I mean, the the guy that I was working with in Indiana was uh, he he became a really good friend, and it kind of kind of fell out at the very end, unfortunately. But he gave me a really good tip when I was buying these houses. Was he, he always was saying, sh keep shuffling the deck, always be shuffling the deck, whether it's yeah. a C class to a B or even a B to a C, buy two Cs to take three Cs and buy one A, like find ways to keep the money moving. And that way you don't get super stagnant on something. And, you know, four years later, you're trying to flip something and they go through an inspection and it's like your house that you thought was worth a hundred, it's really only worth like 60 right. because of all the deferred maintenance, because you haven't shuffled the deck on that thing for four years, yeah, you know? So that's good. there was just a decent little tidbit that I thought was a good base hit where I was like, man, that's, that does make a lot of sense. Cause yeah. they talk about the capital gains and the taxes. That's a whole other side of it, but it makes sense to me where if you can keep the maintenance low, cause that's really where you end up burning your cash flow. Yeah. You really do. Okay, so you move to Birmingham, and you start to kind of think about investing here. You're trying to figure out next steps. Talk to me about, you know, the transition into commercial real estate yeah. and kind of the, the, you know, metamorphosis of that. So I uh, I used to pitch for the Birmingham Barons in 15 and 16, and then I, I, I met a lady. I married her. I have two kids now, you know, the whole thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, a Birminghamian now, I guess. But <laughs> so I, uh, when I finished playing baseball, I, um, went back to get my education because I went to Arkansas for two years, got drafted as a sophomore, did the minor league thing, and then went back and actually got my undergrad or my bachelor's degree from UAB. So here in town. Very cool. And while I was, you know, I was, one of my buddies in Nashville is like a big medical sales guy. And that's, I thought that's what I wanted to do because that's what the, all the athletes do, right? That's what everyone's, you know, selling something in the OR. I was into that. So I actually, right after I got out of college, I graduated, I got a job for striker sports medicine within like four weeks. It was like awesome. Well, if you remember 2020 comes around, the whole COVID thing happens, you know, the whole song and dance. Well, all the while I was still buying those houses up in Indiana while I was living in Birmingham but like I mentioned, I was starting to get a little a little frazzled because I, I I was losing a little bit of trust in my guy up there. So I was trying to make some plans on the back end of what I was going to do 
if I pulled the trigger and sold those or what I would do with the cash. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure it out. Like, am I going to put it in mutual funds? Am I going to be a stock guy? My brother-in-law's a stock guy. Like just trying to figure it out. Right. And so I read a book. It's called, well, actually it's called Real Estate Riches by Dolph De Roos. I read that one first, been following him. And I was like, this is crazy because that book is basically about he compares real estate to 401ks, IRAs, gold, all, all, any other investment that's out there. And he just compares the ins and the outs, pros and cons to real estate. And I was like, man, okay, I'm definitely in the right, I'm in the right spot with real estate. And then, of course, it's like on Amazon, they say, hey, you might be interested in this book too. <laughs> the suggestions. Yeah, the suggestion page. Thank you, Amazon yes. suggestions. Yeah, no wonder <laughs> Bezos is worth what he's worth. So we, so it, the, the suggestion was, Commercial Real Estate Investing, A Creative Way to Make Money by Dolph De Roos, the same guy. What a creative title. Creative <laughs> title. I mean, it is so uncreative, but man. So so I I bought the book for, you know, 13 bucks and I read it. And it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you have the epiphany with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. This was another one of those epiphany books where not only does he talk about real estate and how great it is, but then he starts to go into the differences between residential and commercial real estate, talking about the lengths of the leases, how, um, you know, everything is five to seven years at, on the minimum, how there's way less government interference on commercial, how all the, the tenants are business owners. They're not red lobster waiters. They are entrepreneurial. They maintain the building themselves. They pay the taxes and the insurance. The money's more passive. The banks love to lend money on it because the actual strength of the debt is not so much on the borrower. It's actually the balance sheet of the tenant and their ability to pay rent. That's yeah. the real strength of the debt there. Yeah. So it was a really eye-opening experience for me just reading a book. And so I was like, this is amazing. Like we said a minute ago, just having that ability to just sink or swim, dive in, kind of pull the trigger to hear the gun go off. I just went for it. And so I bought my, I, I just told everybody I knew, like, I'm, I want to buy industrial warehouses. Like that's that's what I want to do. I want to switch from residential. But you get that backlash and everyone says, oh, commercial real estate, it's going to tank. The world's going to end. Commercial is bad. It's, you know, vacancies, whatever the the normal, you know, negativity about it is, yeah. at least that I heard. And I when, I, when I spoke with other people that were a little bit higher net worth, not my peers, they were like, this is the most passive, largest deals that you can do. Why would you not do this? And so mm -hmm. I, I basically, in 2000, and I guess it was 2020, the end of 2020, I bought my first industrial warehouse. And just this last year, I sold all 55 units in Indiana. And I've got about 187,000 square feet now of just industrial, triple net lease, candidly, just passive real estate. Yeah, yeah. So... What does that work as far as buildings? Because I'm coming from the single family place. Are we talking about four buildings, five buildings, two buildings? I know the square footage is ultimately how you talk about yeah. that space, but I'm just curious as far as a building. Yeah, so I've counts. got a total. I've got a total of nine buildings. Okay. So if you space that out, one of them is a little bit larger. I've got like one that's like sixty eight thousand feet. I've got one as small as fifty five hundred feet. Gotcha. So there's just kind of a spectrum and we can get into it, but there's a difference in like, you know, the rent per foot on a larger space versus a yeah. smaller. But it it, it I ranges I got twenty seven thousand feet, fourteen thousand, eighteen thousand, twelve thousand, nine thousand. So kind of like all in this kind of spectrum between sixty eight and fifty five. Talk to me about so I had one brief interaction with a commercial building potential that ended up not working out. But the part of it that made that deal hard to kind of move forward with when I was talking with other people who had more experience, they were talking about um, ceiling height mm -hmm. and access to the industrial side of the building. So half the building was kind of a more like a a com or a resident, not a residential, but like a, a storefront type of a situation with lower ceilings. But then the back end that was more industrial, still the ceilings were not the height. What's an optimal ceiling height for those square footages um, that give you the versatility you want for those spaces? So let's just use an example. I've got a I've got a property that's eighteen thousand square feet over in Tarrant, and there's a little bit of office. I've discovered that if there's less than 10% of office in a building, so at least use 20,000 feet because that's going to make it easier. So 2,000 feet of office is probably the most optimal optimal ratio from warehouse to office. Oh, the okay. less office, 
and more warehouse, the better. I like to have buildings that have a ceiling of 16 to 18 feet. That's probably the most optimal height because then you can have your tenants, if they're stacking product or inventory or any type of equipment, they're going to be able to get some type of, you know, a bobcat. They're going to be able to get, you know, sometimes even 18 wheeler, their, their trailer trucks in the back there. So there's a lot more versatility with the higher ceilings, but the lower part, you know, if you're going to have something that's just more of an office, that's going to be, you know, I want that to be like the smallest portion as possible. Like I want yeah. all warehouse if I can get it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause ultimately they're in that space for the function of, they're not there for an office. It's more of like, have you found with your tenants, it's more of like, Hey, this is a, we do need a little bit of office space. We have a few people. So this is a, a bonus, but not a have to almost. Cause you know, if they need a little extra office space, they can go find an actual office space or work from home or consolidate, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, w- one of the pieces there too, is when you do have a space, this is, this is another one of the cool parts of, of commercial is if you've got a, a, an open warehouse and let's say there's no office, hypothetically, let's just say it's 20,000 feet, 18 foot ceiling heights, prime time opportunity to buy. And the tenant says, Hey, I need, I need like 2000 feet of office or I need whatever, or maybe more. The solution is no problem. I'll build it out for you, but I'm going to, I'm going to bake it into the lease and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to charge you, yeah. you know, interest on. So not to mention, not only does it increase the value because now you've got office, you've got your tenant paying for it. There's some depreciation on that now, and you're earning more cash flow, and you've got more equity because you're able to charge more rent. And with commercial, the yeah. more, the, the higher the net operating income, the more valuable the real estate is. That's so awesome. you have the tenant, you front load the cost, but your tenant pays you back, not only the principal, but with interest. And then, of course, you pay down your your debt with the with the bank. You got more of a, in my opinion, a stronger lease because the tenant is paying for something that he wanted. So you're going to wedge him in there even longer. So he's not going to want to go anywhere. So it just creates more consistent and per, you know, you know, I would say predictable cash flow. Yeah, that's great. Talk. Okay, so talk to me like I'm five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe ten. I don't know. If, yeah, uh, a five year old can understand a triple net <laughs> lease. But for those of us who don't deal in this space you you throw out these terms Sorry. right no 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 it's yeah, not yeah. bad <laughs> but but talk through the basics of the types of leases that are in commercial space because not every single commercial space is going to be a triple net that's right they may negotiate something different or you may have my understanding is if you have a commercial with multiple different tenants and one water source or one you know electrical source you're gonna you they can't triple net it mm-hmm. so talk me through through the different types of leases in the commercial space. So you've got a lot, you've got, you know, you've got absolute net, you've got triple net, double net, single net, and you've got gross modified. There's a lot of different ones. The majority of ones that you're going to see, you're going to see an absolute net lease, which means that the, like, imagine like a Burger King, for example, like that's an absolute net lease, meaning the, the tenant is responsible for everything. There's no landlord responsibilities. Like if that if a tornado hits it or the roof pops off, the Burger King's paying for that. You you as the landlord have no responsibilities. Does the landlord still own the building? He though? owns the building. Okay, and, and the, the land. land. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Correct. But the tenant is responsible for everything. So and in that case, would that owner say like Burger King? You have a piece of land. Burger King is coming to that person and saying, "Hey, we want to build on this land. These are our specs, but you're going to front the cost for that building." I, w- I was talking more on the like let's say that you've a, a current a current Burger King or a current okay. Chick Fil A gotcha. for example. Okay, gotcha. Like a Chick Fil A has already been built. It's already it's already there's people in the drive through. Yeah. You can buy that at a four and a half cap rate right now. Mm-hmm. And if something happens to Chick Fil A, they're corporately guaranteeing that lease. So you're going to get rent whether they're earning income or they're not. And if the roof pops off, Chick Fil A is replacing it, not okay. you. So yeah. that's like the most like that, that's probably the the, the crown jewel of commercial. Right. But that's also the lowest earned return you're going to get. Yeah. The returns are not. Yeah. You're yeah, not going to, yeah. That's probably more for like pension funds and things like yeah, that. Yeah. So the majority of the space I play in is like triple net leases where the tenant is responsible for the property taxes, the insurance, and they maintain the space. I'm responsible to create or to protect the roof and keep the space watertight. So if there's water leaking, some seeping through the floor or something, that's on me. If there's a leak in the roof, he's calling me. But other than that, the what relationship- What about HVAC systems? Are you responsible for Yeah, those? I'm responsible for like, at least out of the gate. If Now, if something happens where they're not cleaning the gutters 
or they're not maintaining the HVAC because they're in charge of the maintenance and something happens to the HVAC or the roof leaks because there was leaves in the gutters that they were responsible to clean, I'm off the hook for that. Interesting. So they are responsible for maintaining all of, I provide them with this watertight space. And if it doesn't become watertight because of something that they didn't do in our lease, they're responsible for it. They drive a truck through the wall. They're responsible they're on for, tr- that. Yeah, they're on for that. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And I'll get the insurance check. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll replace it for them. Okay. So it's a lot of, it. it is a whole nother level of passive than, you know, having a single family home with a tenant in it because, you know, anything happens inside. The plumbing goes out. You got to do it. And oftentimes oh, yeah. they don't maintain the plumbing. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I had a property. This was, man, three weeks ago. I, I shouldn't be in the weeds this much still, but I am sometimes. <laughs> and uh, they had some repairs needed. And I was like, okay, we'll knock them out. So I get a few of my guys, instruct them how to do it. And then one of them was like, Hey, that that uh sink is not draining super well. And I was just like, oh no. No. And so my guys were doing the painting and I'm just like, all right, throw on the gloves. And I mean, I cleaned out a a, a trap in a bathroom oh and it was disgusting. Oh <laughs> You're a better man than I am. But it's just like, I mean, sometimes you gotta roll up your sleeves. I don't always wanna be there in that place. Um, but all that to say is that plumbing is my responsibility. That's right. You know, at the end of the day, they didn't maintain it. They didn't do a good job of making sure it would stay clear, but it's not working, so it's got to be fixed. Well, another piece on that. So, so not to say that residential again is is, you know, not a bad thing, but you're able to charge a gross amount of rent. So, you're able to say, "Hey, I'm going to charge you $2,000 and you're going to take all those expenses out of that, maybe service some debt, but whatever's left over is your net cash flow." So with these commercial properties, these triple net leases, your gross income is also your net income because your tenant is responsible for those outgoings. Most people would ask this, and I asked the same question. I said, why why does it make sense for a tenant to want to pay those expenses? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would someone want to do that? And as I started to turn over the rocks, I discovered that it's more advantageous, believe it or not, for the tenant to want to take on those responsibilities. Number one, Because if they can have a lower net rent per foot, because remember, if you're charging a gross over here and taking out expenses to net your income, these guys are able to have a lower net rent per foot and then pay the expenses out of it. So what it allows them to do, these these overhead costs, maybe they can go negotiate with the insurance carrier for a cheaper price. They can go to the city if they think that they're being overcharged for property taxes. Maintaining the building you probably are the same with residential, like your tenants aren't the best at mowing the yard and trimming the bushes. My tenants, on the other hand, when they have customers show up to their business where they earn their income, they have an not even an obligation, but they just have an incentive to keep it nice. Because if it looks like crap and there's like a bunch of trash around and there's customer shows up, they're going to think that this is like, I don't know if I want to do business with these people. Yeah. Would you prefer the landlord or would you prefer yourself to be in charge of keeping your property up? Yeah. What if a guy that, that lives in Colorado is the owner of that property? You'd much rather say, dude, let me just handle it myself, you know? So that's why the tenant actually prefers to have all of those costs wrapped in and baked into their monthly expense. And so to take one step further, all of the, most of my, not most, all of my tenants are, I don't have one mom and popper. They're all anywhere grossing from two to $25 million a year in, in gross revenue. Now, it's not sure what they're taking home. But the kicker is one of the most important pieces is that these tenants understand the difference between their variable and their fixed cost. So obviously, rent is a fixed cost in their business. They have accounts, they have probably attorneys, maybe even on retainer that can understand that, hey, when we're running our numbers, the rent is how we earn our livelihood. That's how we make a living is having our product, our inventory, our equipment in this space. This is the most important piece of our equation in order to drive a profit in our business. Yeah. And so if I, so again, to go even further, this is the reason why they love these longer leases is because if they can, if they can predict into the future, 60 months, 96 months into the future, what their fixed cost is going to be, it's going to allow them to run their business that much more efficiently versus somebody that has a gross lease and says, hey, here's what your rent is right now today. Next year, 
Who's to say up. I can't change it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, do you yeah. do you do increases like there's a percentage increase baked into like a five year lease? You're like you're locked in at you're not locked in at this rate for five years, but you can at least predict these increases over the course of the five years or is it set for five years no so it'll go up three percent every year okay. every one of those leases has like but a they 3%. can still figure that out oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's like it's clear not as day. like it's it's in a signed document that yep. says okay every three every year we got to increase by three percent but they you're right they don't they're not being over leveraged by someone who is saying oh this year you know a covet happened Things are going crazy. It's like, no, sorry, we're in a five-year lease. That's right. You know, we, your costs may go up on maintenance for that roof, which you would maybe want to hit them with, hey, let's go 5 6%. It's like, no, sorry, this is what's we have lease. a lease. That's yeah. right. So there's, there's probably an inherent security on both sides, but there's probably also a little bit of margin of like, well, I could also incur more costs certain years because those variables and I can't charge the tenant. Mm -hmm. um, for those. Well, you know, I look at it from a standpoint of the tenant is going to run its business as, and, and this sounds kind of funny, but I've never like gotten a beer with a tenant. I've gotten like four beers with, with my tenants. Like I'm trying to help them. I, the coolest part is where most of the time, like I said, with residential, you feel like it's you versus them. You guys are like working against each other. You got to pay me rent on time. And if you don't, I'm going to evict you. On the other hand, We've got this working business relationship where we're both in this to win. We're both trying to, I'm trying to help them run an efficient business by giving them or providing them a watertight space to run their business. And so when we're both on the same page about that, it ends up creating this really passive, friendly relationship where I stay out of their way. They call me if something's up. But other than that, I just ACH in the rent every month and we're just like on the same page. Like if something's up, holler at me. If not, we'll just touch base in a year from now. That's so it's awesome. it's a really, it's a really um a cool, cool relationship compared to what it was on the other side. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, I'm assuming location matters because there's certain areas zoned for industrial, but from a standpoint of like we need to be in the specific area. A lot of these companies are fine with driving because they realize like, you know, you mentioned Tarrant and that may not be as popular of a place for a house to be, mm -hmm. but for an industrial, it's like, no, there's a lot of industrial there and that's not a big deal for me to bring my crews in or bring my team in and that's a space that's a little bit cheaper maybe than downtown industrial and it works for us, so it's good to go. So how important is location in this commercial space comparatively to, to me, someone who like, understands residential slash single family investments, location is almost everything. But I feel like maybe it's a little bit different of a looking glass. Well, location is is very important, but it's from a different perspective than residential. So, you know, if you got location, meaning you're in Mountain Brook, you're in a great location, right? Versus maybe being in Inslee. Like yeah. it's just the location's better in Mountain Brook. It's just right. what it is. In regards to industrial the location, the most important piece that I've discovered, even talking with my banker, is some of these tenants, they actually really focus on how many stoplights are off the interstate? How close are we to the interstate? Because if we have a distribution business, how long does it actually take us to get from our space onto the highway where there's no issues? Right. So so I've tried to find properties. It's hilarious. When I go and, and I'm looking at a building, I put this on my uh, proposal for finance. We can get into this. With, when I go and propose financing to bankers, I don't ask for money. I offer them. I offer them an opportunity to invest with me. Yeah. But I tell them. Uh, I even tell them I stopwatch it from where I from the parking lot to getting on the highway. How quickly does it take me to get on the highway? And then also with my leasing agents, we 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 make sure that all of our tenants know. Hey, from this space is how quickly you can get on the highway. If that's important to your business, what other factors are important when looking at commercial? Well, like you mentioned before, ceiling heights definitely one of them. You know, obviously the the I think the lease most importantly, like you said a minute ago, talking about a gross lease versus a triple net. So there are gross leases as well, and that means like let's say you've got like a shopping center. I've got a building over in uh, Trustville that's got three tenants in there, and that's a gross lease where every month, you know, the tenants reimburse me for the utilities, but 
they, you know, they're, they're all separately metered. And then I pay the taxes and the insurance out of whatever I earn from there. So it's, it's, it's important, but to go down this little thing, this, these tenants have a different perspective on their business than maybe a triple net lease does. And I discovered this kind of, not the hard way, but just from having conversations with these guys, it's, you're, you're diving back into the single family yes, home uh, you, mentality. You discover, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> you discover that even these business owners are like, well, you know, there's leaves in the in the gutters and, well, there's pine needles and there's ants everywhere where I would never get that from a yeah. tenant in one of my other buildings because they would just do it themselves. It's, it's again, it's just a weird mindset that is not wrong or right. It's just different. And I've discovered I just, you know, that's given me, it's more bandwidth over there than, you know, it's working in the business, not on the business kind of thing. Yeah. So it's almost like there's an inverse, you know, and I'm not proposing anything revolutionary, but, you know, your involvement to the inverse of your um, lack of involvement is returns, you know, to a degree. I know that there, there's margins there and stuff, but like you said, you, you have the Chick-fil-A returns aren't great, but it's almost zero maintenance. It's set up They're oh, yeah. there for 10 years, leases, you know, probably going to resign. Um, well, the main reason why they will resign, and this is one thing I wanted to make a great point on, is one of the reasons why is these why these leases are so long. Again, the predictability of you know their ability to look at the fixed cost of their business into the future like that. But imagine for a second too a business that let, let's say there were a dentist hypothetically, right? It could be gross lease, could be net lease, doesn't matter. Let's say there's a dentist and they have a five year lease on this space somewhere in Birmingham. And five years comes up and there's no option to renew. It's just, hey, the lease ends after five years. This dentist has been in this space for five years. All of his clients know where Dr. Smith is. What happens if that landlord decides and says, hey, you know what, Dr. Smith? You're out. I got somebody else coming behind you who's going to pay double what you're paying. You got to go find somewhere else. So Dr. Smith moves across town. He probably will lose half of his clientele that he just acquired over the last 60 months. Yeah. So the incentive is for the tenant and candidly the landlord too is to bake in some of those options to renew because that doctor, that dentist is going to want to like keep riding that location because he knows that if he moves from that location, he's going to lose half of his clientele and half of his in income. And that creates for me yeah. a lot longer roadmap for, for cash flow and predictability. It's funny you use dentists because my dentist actually moved and he just moved down the road which I thought was very wise because for the most part, you're not going to drop that 50. If you moved across town, yeah. a lot of people would drop off because, you know, it's like, well, I probably just want to find someone closer. Um, but I, so I you recall, don't like your dentist that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because I recall and I'm like, I think they like communicated that location change like a ton. And it's probably because that very reason is just like, hey, by the way, we've moved. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I know. All yeah. my next appointments at this place down the road. Um, that's really interesting. Talk me through, okay, so underwriting in single family world, typically vacancy is something you say, hey, X amount for that. 5% is kind of the going, you know, norm for, for vacancies when you're looking at a single family. Um, what is the vacancy that you calculate or underwrite in your commercial space? Because I know I had one conversation with a commercial guy and he did the calculations and he was like, yeah, we basically could float this for two years if we had to. And I was like, hmm. whoa. But he was he was basically planning out worst case scenario. I feel like unless you, he's like, unless you have a tenant, that's kind of what you need to be aware of is this could stay vacant for a lot longer till you find the right person. How do you do vacancies and, and kind of underwrite that? That's a good question. So I would say that number one, I try and provide as much information as I can to my bankers because they're the ones that, that are lending me their money and they tend to use like a 10% vacancy. But I, I, I like to almost, uh, challenge these guys, not so much my bankers, but I like to challenge my limited partners. I like to challenge people who think about this because if you're buying a unique space, if you're buying something that, like you mentioned before, it's got some smaller ceiling in the front, it's got some higher ceiling in the back, maybe it's off the side road, like something that is, you know, uh, not even wonky, but just would take a unique tenant. That's when those types of spaces, you know, 
have trouble getting released because it takes a more unique tenant to lease or potentially option to buy. When I'm buying my buildings, they are all the same. I'm, I mean, other than the square footage, they're all the same. They're a mile off the highway. They're 16 to 18 foot ceiling heights, sometimes even higher. They are business owners that are distribution guys or fabricators or steel supply guys, all the similar types of businesses because that's my, and they're all anywhere between two to 25 million in gross revenue. So they have a fixed cost that I, that they know that they can pay. So I, I, I've built this like kind of little, if you want to call it a buy box, I kind of call it like a lease box really, because I know that the buildings that I'm purchasing has a massive tenancy pool. And so it allows my leasing agent to get really into it. My, 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 my broker only sends me deals that's very specific to what I'm looking for. I don't spend any time on LoopNet or Crexy. I've focused really hard on just building my team out and assembling the right team. The broker will send me the deal because he knows exactly what I'm looking for. And if he knows it's in my realm, I'll buy it and he'll get paid because that's his motivation. He knows exactly what I'm looking for. From there, my leasing guy knows what types of tenants rent my buildings because I buy the same types of buildings. So he's got a tenancy pool in his back pocket that he can pull from for, for that. Hey, I'm, I got 13,000 feet coming up. Hey, I've got 18,000 feet, 6,000 feet. Hey, I've got 28,000 feet right now. I'm looking to downsize to 18,000. And I have the building most likely, most of the time, like two weeks leased before I even close because my leasing guy has the guy in his pocket. My bankers have discover my risk appetite. So they become more comfortable with the buildings that I'm acquiring. Sometimes I'll buy them vacant, which increases the value big time when I lease them. But it creates this kind of very easy step-in-step -step system. My accountant knows the type of cost segregation studies that we do on the buildings because we do the we use the same guy and we do the same thing. So it creates this like very kind of flywheel method where it's like it takes a little bit of time out of the gate. But as it goes, it gets faster and faster and faster to where now we're kind of like puppeteers and we're just like managing everybody and keeping them in their spot. Yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. And you're right. I mean, we'll call it the three, two of commercial. You know? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, nailed it, nailed it, uh, nailed it. You know, there is a buy box in the single family. And I hate to keep on making these parallels, but it's my context it's, oh, and a lot of people who listen to this podcast. But, yeah. you know, you have this this basic three bedroom, two bath that is, you know, for the most part going to function as a space that most families can live in. And maybe if they're a little larger, they're a little tight, a little smaller. It's like, oh, it's, we got a little extra space. But for the most part, everybody wants, needs at least three bedrooms and everybody doesn't, you know, everybody gets home and they, they're like, we need two bathrooms. <laughs> you know? We've 100%. all learned that lesson oh, in the 3-1. Yeah. Sometimes um, the hard way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My first house actually is a 3-1 and I quickly learned like, you know, it's, I, I digress, but you know, our second home, it came to like, Hey, what are our must haves? And two bathrooms yes. was right off the bat. Like yes. it must have the th the one bath didn't work. You, you might even <laughs> consider building another bathroom <laughs> yeah. just to make, you can make it a two, two, even yeah, or something. Exactly. A one, two. Yeah. <laughs> one, two. But so all that to say is, um, that's really interesting because you basically have said, I'm going to buy the three, two of commercial. It's going to fit the most. And so your vacancy and going back to that previous, you know, my very limited commercial experience, it was the one where I would say um, it was kind of three sections. It was like, you know, I would say probably 20 percent. The front end was very office, like low ceilings. Then there was a mid section that was more built out to be kind of, you know, uh, kind of industrial like functional was a print shop so they did print stuff so it kind of needed to be clean but it wasn't full industrial and then the back half i would say that was probably about 50 percent of it and the back 30 percent was you know fully industrial like cement floors and nice and so that whole building unless you put another print shop in it yep. or something who needed those divisions of space it really didn't function and the ceiling height was a little bit lower and all these things that that's, I think, why when I brought that deal to that commercial guy, he was like, hey, this is how you have to break this apart and think about this building is going to only provide an experience for a very unique tenant. That's now, right. that said, if they do get in there, they may stay a while because it's fit their their box, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, if you want to get into the space, right, 
you have a you know commercial real estate collective. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you start this journey? How where would you start? I mean, you start with that book that you suggested earlier, which we can put in the show notes. But where do you start? Like, how do you start making connections? How do you start you know kind of going down this pathway because it's a very different oh, yeah. space, um, and I feel like fewer players play in this space. Well, like you said a second ago, it's there's a ton of competition in residential. Not only are you competing against other investors, but you're competing against people that are wanting to refinance or not wanting to move. So the it's keeping the maybe the supply down. There you're competing against first time home buyers. There's a lot of competition in residential. And so if you know what you're looking for in commercial, you can you can you can make a killing. It's but you have to know what to look for. And so I started this commercial real estate collective because I have a lot of questions like what you just asked, how does somebody start? The fastest way that somebody can literally get three deals off market, this is the keys in the Mercedes. When you're driving down, you know, think about you're driving in Homewood and you pass by a shopping center or a Mountain Brook or wherever it is, and you pass by this shopping center and it says for lease. Call up John Smith or whoever's leasing it and don't say, hey, John, I'd like to buy commercial real estate. Don't say that because if I'm John, I'm not calling you back because you don't sound like you have any clue what you're doing. But if you were to call John and say something like this, hey, John, my name's Nolan. I just saw your four lease sign over on 123 Main. Not really looking for that type of space, but I am looking for something that's 10 to 25,000 feet, 16, 18 foot ceiling heights, less than a mile off the highway. At least has to be less than five stoplights off. Do you by chance have anything kind of in your ballpark or guys you're working with that are working on something like that? Nah, well, I'm leasing this space. I don't have, no, no, no problem. What do you got? You don't cut them. You don't, you don't like cut them off, but you interject and say, well, what do you got? Hmm. Because you used commercial real estate vocabulary right out of the gate, he doesn't even know who you are. But because you used, and, and, and here's another tip, don't say, don't say square feet. Say how many feet you got. You got, not, I, I, I have 120, I have 125,000 square feet. Say, I, hey, I, I want, I'm looking for 10,000 feet. If you say that, you are seasoned. So use good, like, seasoned veteran vocabulary. The guy on the other line is going to be I feel like, like this advice is coming from you said square I'm feet. I'm telling you, time. oh, 100%. <laughs> and I didn't get a call back. <laughs> so I didn't get a Sorry call back. Sorry to interrupt, but I was like, oh, dude, man. he totally said square feet. Oh, man, I, was. So, <laughs> I was like, I said, like, square feet. I said it like that. And the yeah. guy's like, this guy is such a novice. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I basically, I basically, if that's the best way to get into it. And then, but I really tell people, you know, that's going to get, cause he's going to respond and say, well, I do, I do have like 30,000 feet over. He's, he's going to pop off a couple, maybe off market opportunities that you, he would have never called and told you if you would have said, Hey, I'm looking for a commercial. Yeah. But to, to go a step behind that, I think the biggest, most important piece. And I, and I, I preach this in our collective is building your team. That's got to be the number one step. I have a I have a friend of mine who's similar, trying to get into commercial, and he's so focused on the deal. He's on loop net at night looking at property and you know trying to make it. And I'm like, dude, you're wasting your time because candidly, if you're looking for 25,000 feet in Birmingham and you're on loop net, it's already gone and you're competing against me. I've got like three brokers that are sniffing the ground to find deals. And if they find what they're looking for, they're going to call me first. And so you're competing against me. So instead of focusing on, you know, looking at LoopNet and feeling like you're working when really you're just being busy, you're not being productive, instead of doing that, maybe focus on having coffees with brokers, meeting bankers, having conversation with CPA. So like in our group, we have like, we call it the 20 point week where basically we have this pool of actionable steps that you can take every week. And we, you know, we don't tell people what to do, but we got like a little accountability coach that says, Hey, if you want to join this and you really want to succeed, you can, you have all of these action steps that you can take every single week to move your career forward to getting that first property or that fifth property. And we got a guy that's going to run beside you and say, Hey, come on, stay in it. Come on, keep coming. So it's all about trying to help guys get in the game and, you know, kind of go back all the way and spend their time how they want through commercial versus yeah. you know, owning units or doors. Yeah, that's 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 really good advice. And I think, you know, everybody goes through, 
you know, like we did, rich dad, poor dad, but at some point you had to take action, Mm -hmm. you know, and and the similar thing is like, if you, if you want to branch into a new venture of real estate, which that's one of the things that I love about real estate is there's so many different ways to make money, so many different ways to explore and learn, um, a, a different pathway. You can learn something new every day, but you know, while you're on that journey, you just, you have a time where you got to like, you know, learn, but at some point you got to take those action steps and then it's the consistency of those will eventually turn your opportunities up, but it, it doesn't happen overnight. What is your typical, you know, I would say in the single family world, if you're prospecting, trying to find something, you're going to find a deal within three to six months. Does that change with commercial or is that kind of run true in that space as well? Um, sooner, later, like what have you seen? Well, I was, I'll be candid. The, the the guys in our group, again, not everybody is the same. It depends upon your tenacity. It depends upon how motivated you are to succeed. We've got not a huge amount of people. We've got 26 people in our group right now. And I'd say at least half of them have at least something under contract. And That's we've awesome. only had it for maybe eight months. Yeah. So some people have joined a month ago. Other people joined at the very beginning. So it's kind of a spectrum of how much action you want to take. It goes back to what you said. I think out of the gate when people are starting something new that's uncomfortable or they hear it's risky. My experience was when I heard commercial out of the gate, I I put my hands up and said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, that's not, that's not the way to do it because that's, that's risky. You know, my dad told me not to do that. Don't do that. That's, that's scary. (laughs) And it scared me because you hear, you hear all these debt service ratios, expense metrics, you hear all these (laughs) things that if you don't know them, it, it, it puts a little bit of fear and it made me afraid because I didn't want to lose. Yeah. And so, and so when I, you know, discovered that it really wasn't as difficult as I thought, just putting in the time, what ends up happening is you get this little win, you get this little win and it builds that kind of momentum and that confidence. Cause that's really at the end of the day, that's really what our group is about is building confidence in commercial real estate. So they can submit that first letter of intent. They can get that first term sheet from the bank and then they can close their first deal. Yeah. Talk me through, I I love this question because we often don't know what we don't know. So what question should I be asking about commercial real estate, um, industrial space that I, that I don't know I should be asking, if that makes Interesting. sense. Interesting. What question should you be asking? Hmm. Well, let's think about this. I would, if you're talking, are you talking about like so much like metrics or just like in regards to the overall commercial in general? I think probably for coming from someone who is trying to understand it, not in the space currently trying to figure it out. But what question do it's like, like a good example would be you said close to the highway. Mm-hmm. That's a tidbit that like. I mean, that that oh, in gotcha, itself gotcha, is like gotcha. worth the listen of this podcast, in sure. my opinion. You sure. know, I mean, there's been several nuggets dropped. And this is a space I know very little about. So yeah. I feel like this whole episode is yeah, like yeah, yeah. nuggets, you know, for someone who understands commercial, they'll probably be like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, like, um, but all that to say is someone who maybe is a little more like like a nugget gotcha. like that or, or a question that I, I thought of. But it's like, I don't know even about this whole section of this is what you got to understand, like another thing that pops up is like, do you have to do um, a lot of like environmental studies before you make the purchase? Like, sure. like does the commercial bankers require more due diligence that, you know, I don't know about, but maybe there is more due diligence than a single family home. I'd say two things then. So number one, talking about due diligence, one is the, ter- the, the deal close is a lot longer. So you probably maybe bought a house in seven or 10 days in the past, maybe yeah. like that you can, you can get some out of contract and close yeah. commercial. Sometimes they go like 75 days from like under contract to close. So you can inspect and anticipate a lot longer, you know, due diligence period and then inspection period and things like that. So there's a, there's some more, you know, yeah, you can talk about environmental studies, you know, we can, you know, you can get into that. Most, most properties don't have those issues unless there was something in the past, but now that, now that I understand what you mean, I think the biggest thing that someone has to understand between residential and commercial, the biggest difference is residential real estate is valued based upon the comparable sales in the area. And commercial real estate is valued based upon the net operating income. The value of commercial real, the intrinsic value is based upon the net operating income. So, so I'd ask you, if you've got 10 houses in a cul-de-sac and they're all going for 200,000 bucks, and then there's an 11th house 
but they've got a brand new kitchen or bathroom. What is the what is the value of that eleventh house? Do you think? I think the eleven it could probably two twenty. Two twenty, maybe know, we'll right? Just say yeah, roughly. at most two twenty, <laughs> right? Because the other, I mean, I probably would only pay two hundred five, maybe. Yeah. Because the other ones around it are only worth two hundred, so I'd be overpaying by five yeah, or yeah. twenty. Yeah, yeah. What I've discovered is residential real estate is intrinsic value is based upon what's around it. Commercial real estate's value is based on your creativity. If you can increase the net operating income, the bottom line value, the return on investment, and you can increase it, you increase the value because intrinsic value, the easiest way you can discover this, it's the net operating income divided by the market cap rate. Right. Simple. Yeah, yeah. 100 grand of net operating income, you divide it by a 0.1, which is a 10% cap rate, you got a million dollar building. So let's say you got 20,000 feet, you got one tenant leasing it for a hundred grand and you got a vacancy over here. You buy this building for a million bucks, hypothetically. Right. You go and lease this other space for the same for here. So now you've got 200,000 of income. The cap rate didn't change before you bought it for a million. So the new income is $200,000 divided by the market cap rate. The value is now $2 million just because you leased the space. Hmm. So you just created seven figures of value because of your creativity and to find a tenant for that vacancy. Yeah. Like it goes back to what you were talking about in taking care of, you know, your tenants, having conversations, having a beer, sitting down and say, Hey, how, how can I keep you in the space longer? How mm -hmm. can we work on this? You know, maybe if I do build out another two offices, he's like, you know, grumbling, it's like, Oh, we're expanding, we're moving and I need two office spaces. Well, what if I do that? Can we, can we up the rent? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, boom, right there, you've increased the value overnight with just a conversation. Um, you know, that's just, I mean, it's it's brilliant. It's a lot of how multifamily you oh, know, yeah. works and, yep. and, you know, it is intrinsically. I think the interesting thing about single family is when I sell tenant-occupied properties, I'm bridging this gap between the comps in the area and the income because, I mean, you know, when it's occupied, there is income coming in and they have to underwrite it with the income. But then on the backside, there is this owner occupant potential of the house being worth more. And so there's certain price brackets. We actually tell them to vacate the property and fix it up because the highest value use of that is to an owner occupant. It's not as, as a tenant occupied property. I'd be curious to think if, if residential is more valuable, if it's vacant than it is occupied. No, that's, yeah, it oh, okay, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I was saying. Yeah, yeah it, agreed, it is. Agreed. Yeah, now I will say in Birmingham, I find that the sub, I would say 100 is right at kind of that brink point where the the value starts to be muddy and, you know, post that like 70K, typically we say keep the tenant in it because it's going to be honestly hard to finance and sell as a vacant property. They do sell but typically to another investor, to an investor who's right. going to still buy it. And their projections may be more, um, you may have an inexperienced investor who over projects the rent. You know, they come in, you know, guns blazing, figure out they think they know more than it, you know anybody else. And mm -hmm. they're like, I'm going to get 950. Oh, you're here. talking about me when, like six years ago? <laughs> it's like, that was me. Like, this property will get 950. And you're that like, was me. no, that's 800, day, 800 all day. bucks all yep. day, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, so anyway, <laughs> but no, I think I think this, this is a super interesting conversation and it, it sparks so many, um, to be honest, it sparks so many like, intrinsic like questions that I'm like, we'll probably talk offline oh, <laughs> on yeah. this podcast oh, for another hours, you know, but um, when we're talking about commercial space, you move from the single family into commercial space. Walk me through any potential fears that you had or moments maybe that, you know, we all have had an HVAC go out, you know, was there any moments when you were starting to bridge into commercial space and something went really bad and you're like, oh, did I make the right call? Or has it been, for the most part, pretty stable and all that kind of stuff? Or, Well, I, th I think the answer to that is, is you know, if you're not ever pushing yourself to, to feel a little uncomfortable, you're really not pushing hard enough, right? Yeah. I mean, you and I are very similar in that aspect. I, I think for me, the biggest the biggest time that I have fear or I have anxiety is if I'm thinking about things that I can't control, right? 
we've all, you know, oh, well, what happens if this happens or what happens? That? So let's figure out what is the controllable piece to the uncontrollable thought that I have. My biggest, my biggest, um, I would say my biggest initial fear was me not being confident in myself enough. And what I mean is, or not, I don't know if that's the right way of describing it. Same but, square feet. <laughs> yeah, 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 sir, yeah, there you go. That's number one. Don't do that again. But basically, you know, when I was, you know, initially first buying stuff, you know, trying to get creative, you know, we, we can talk about that too, but talking about creativity behind things, but raising money for deals, I had this fear of myself that I wasn't adequate or somebody that I called on or an investor wouldn't wouldn't take me seriously. And I had this fear or this like insecurity in myself that I wasn't good enough or I wasn't smart enough. I didn't know what I was doing well enough. And what I've discovered is it's like anything else, like reps in the cage. You know, the more you do it, the more conversations that you have, you you develop that confidence. It's, it's the little wins where someone says, hey, yeah, especially when you have a conversation with somebody and say, hey, thanks for thinking of me. I appreciate you thinking of me. That's like a little dopamine hit where you're like, man, all right. This one guy goes, is a, this guy's a decent player, and he said thanks for thinking of me. So it's like that gave me some more confidence to be like, you know what, I can bring value to other people too. So I think initially my biggest fear wasn't about the size of the building or the the number. Maybe when you first got into the seven figure deals, when I bought my first million and a half building, it was that was a little spooky because yeah. that was bigger than the normal eighty thousand dollar house I was buying. But now nowadays it's it's that's a normal candidate. That's just like that's a good that's just a good base hit deal now. But I think when you're doing the big deals, we're looking at like a five and a half million dollar deal now, raising the capital for that is just it's it's another, it's a bigger bite. And having to get over my insecurity of myself and being like, you know, people want to invest with me too. I, I don't I'm not asking for people's money. I'm offering them a really cool opportunity. Mm. And instead of looking at myself as like, woe is me, would you like to invest? It's like, dude, come and check out what I got. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to get a piece of this too. Who knows? And having the confidence and like have it ooze out of you to know like, hey, this is a really cool opportunity. If you if you miss it, guess what? The next guy's gonna get it. You wanna yeah. be a, you want in or you want out? How much <laughs> yeah. you want to invest? And so I've developed the confidence over time. And sometimes I you gotta fake it till you make it, of course. But that's that's been something that I've just that was my initial fear, I guess, out of the gate. No, that that is that's true. I mean, all of us probably have a little bit of imposter syndrome, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, to a degree, we weren't, you know, I came from a family similar to you, probably that the Rich Dad Poor Dad book was significant in like, oh, how does money make more money? Like that wasn't discussed at my, you mm -hmm. know, my dinner table, you know, and those kind of conversations. We didn't discuss any of that at the dinner table. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, it's just like, <laughs> so it's all foreign. But, but, you know, sometimes you do have to, you know, pump yourself up a little bit. Mm -hmm. You have to just say, you know what, I I feel like an imposter, but at the end of the day, People think about themselves more, way more than they think about you. Walk them with confidence. Try your best. And, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Someone no. someone laughs you out of the room. <laughs> yeah. And you'll learn from it and you'll grow from it and you're going to go swing another, you know, you know, thing. I think the worst thing that actually could happen is you don't take another swing. And, you know, uh, everybody, if they're a baseball guy, they're a Derek Jeter fan. And one of his, my favorite quotes of his was, one reporter after a game, he was like 0 for 18 or something. They said, hey, Derek, you're like 0 for, dude. And he goes, he says, well, that just every time I get out, that just means I'm closer to my next hit. It's math. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's kind of a cool, if you look at, I mean, everybody probably talks about this on other podcasts, but it's like, hey, if you know that you got to get 18 no's to get your first yes, you would almost feel joy when you get a no because you're like, heck yeah, I'm closer to my next win or my next base hit or the yeah. next yes, you know, if you're raising money or making offers, you know? Yeah, that's incredible, man. So, you know, we've kind of covered all the commercial stuff. I want to circle back. I think, you know, one lesson informs the next lesson, informs the next lesson. Sports for you was probably pretty pivotal, pivotal early on, you know, developing your character, developing your work ethic. Give me a few lessons you kind of took away from those experiences that you feel inform your success today? Well, 
number one, when I was playing baseball, of course, the work ethic, I would I would be the guy that after baseball games, I'd, I'd go hit in the cage. I was kind of a, one of those guys that just wanted to make it. I just had this, and candidly, you know, I'm sure my grandpa will watch this, but he had a huge impact on me because I just wanted to, I wanted to make everybody proud of me. I wanted to work so hard and make them proud that I was going and going to play college and professional baseball. I wanted to make my family proud. So I had this like perfectionism style in my head where nothing was ever good enough. So I had to keep pushing and pushing. I was never, ever good enough for anybody, especially my parents, especially my, you know, I just Mm. was never good enough. And so it kept driving me to keep, keep going and keep practicing. That kind of has maybe gone over to the underwriting aspect, being perfect about what we're doing, raising the money on the real estate side, things like that. But I think one of the most important things that I took away from professional baseball and college ball too was I wanted to be remembered, not so much for the balls and the strikes and the ins and the outs, but I wanted to be respected as a teammate. I wanted to be a great teammate where when someone thinks of Nolan Sandberg, like, God, that guy was a great guy. He was a good dude. He cared about the team. He wanted the team to win. Yeah, he was a not a very good pitcher, but he was he was always in the clubhouse. He was a clubhouse guy. And so I've tried to take that mentality of always putting other people first, trying to make other people win, and having the tide raise all ships. Mm-hmm. And it ends up, you know, helping me sleep better at night. I'm able to know that, hey, I'm I'm not out there trying to cheat somebody or get cute and cut a you know shortcut anybody. It's it's kind of instilled in me that I just want to see everybody win. And if everyone else can get a piece of it while we're at it, then, then again, like I said, the tie raises all ships. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about a deal um, recently that I've worked with, uh, just talked with another agent about, and there's a little bit of discrepancy of maybe moving it and all this kind of stuff. And it's like so short sighted because their name's attached to it and the choices they're making aren't great, you know, to be honest. Um, and it, it would probably ru- not ruin, but maybe definitely hinder their ability to get another deal from this agent. And honestly, every other potential person in that office, because he's not handling mm. the agreement great, you know, and, and it is what it is at yeah. the end of the day. But like, I think that a smaller percentage of the profit, but doing 20 more deals over the life term or 100 more deals is going to make you way more money and make everyone else around you win than just trying to make this one deal like win. And going back to the baseball a long time ago, um, I sat down with a, someone, you know, kind of mentor, someone I knew really well, had has some business success. And I was like trying to figure out, it was actually my first rental property slash opportunity. So we currently had a house trying to find a new house and turn the old one into a rental. And I was just really trying to like, I was trying to eke every equity piece, like find the best deal at the new house and all this kind of stuff. And he said, Todd, it's about doubles and singles. And, you know, the home runs happen every once in a while, but like you just consistently do doubles and singles and you're going to win. And so, you know, I think where focus is on making everybody win and just getting on the bases and just can keep on getting on the bases Um, rather than I'm going to knock it out of the park, but on the way to that, I'm going to screw everybody over. You're only going to have to strike out a lot, (laughs) swing for the fence. (laughs) Yeah. You know? So, um, I really took that away and I was just like, yeah, it's just like, like consistently consistency, just showing up and stuff. So, and to go further on that, I I think a big piece that a lot of people don't consider is again, that is a very short sighted approach, unfortunately, and he's going to burn a bridge. That's, I'm, if I was that agent, I'd never send him another deal again. I just wanted, yeah. there's too many investors out there to work with somebody that's going to take bandwidth away, you yeah. know? But I've almost candidly taken the opposite approach where I am thrilled to pay the guys on my team, thrilled to pay the the the, light, the agents. I'm, I'm paid to, or I'm thrilled to pay the accountants, the attorneys, because when I call, they're going to pick up the phone, you know? It's like if they know that Nolan's calling, there's probably something on the there's probably a reason he's calling. And every time I do something with Nolan, I'm somehow getting paid something. And so I always try and put my guys first. It's, you know, maybe it's the the opposite of the entrepreneur way of paying yourself first. But I think if you keep all of your teammates happy, the brokers are getting paid. They're sending you more leads. The leasing guy is going to keep your tenants in their pocket. The accountant's always going to want to get your form done first so you can pay out your K-1s. Like all that info, like all of those people, when they're happy, 
they're always going to want to do more business with you. I've, I've never had that short-sighted, one-off, try and make a quick buck approach because it just, you burn a bridge, you do that, that, especially in a small town, that'll get out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, very much so. So what does the future hold for you in this space? I mean, kind of what are you, you're working on a deal right now? Are you just continually, you know, have that buy box and that's the plan for the future and then just kind of grow from there? Or do you have any other special ideas or adjacent projects you're kind of thinking about? Well, I, I, you know, there's a lot, every time you drive down the highway, you see these massive warehouses that are getting built 100 and 250,000 feet, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think I'll ever get into that because I think that is shrinks the tenancy pool. Like we talked about earlier, I think I'm going to stick between 10 to 40,000 square feet of existing structures. That's kind of where, because candidly, you know, there's not a whole lot of them. So it's kind of a, a hot commodity. There's a lot of tenancy pool in that style of space. So I'm going to try and keep buying those buildings but I think we're going to try and take down some some potential development opportunities and start developing those style of buildings for particular tents, kind of some build to suit. So we'll see if it happens or not. But I think that what we've discovered, what I've discovered is if you can, you know, find a vacant warehouse, a 10,000 foot vacant warehouse, buy it with some creative terms from the seller, lease the space up you can pretty much refinance your equity back out and be in the deal for no money. Mm -hmm. We haven't even got into the cost segs or the depreciation, but that's a whole other side yeah, where yeah. <laughs> you can end up, you know, not paying taxes and the whole thing and the cash flow and everything. So it's, it's like a whole conglomerate that it gets me excited because I'm able to, you know, have limited partners that want to join in and they get a piece of that too. So it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty fun. Yeah. We'll need a big screen back here to get in the cost. <laughs> oh God, like, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Run through all those pages of the, that the thing. Numbers. It is, it is, it's an interesting thing. Cause you know, in this format, you, you can only dive so deep in oh, the yeah. actual like nuances. You really kind of sometimes need a, uh, like the, the collective or something to dive into the nitty gritty numbers, um, you know, but, but hopefully this is like broad strokes. This has been yeah. super helpful for me, yeah. but broad strokes on understanding the space and the potential and stuff. Um, if someone wants to get a hold of you to talk about the collective mm -hmm. or, um, anything else, uh, how do they, how do they reach out? Well, I've got a social media following a little bit on TikTok. I'm the I guess I'm the infinite banking investor. I might've changed it to the industrial real estate investor, but you can find me, Nolan Sandburn. I'm on there, Instagram, everything. Reach out to me. Like, I'm, I guess I've got a little YouTube page too. I just, I mean, you can like literally text me. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so, I'll answer the phone. I'm, I'm not somebody that's got like three assistants or anything. I just, I don't know how to distill it down more that I, I love seeing other people win. I, you know, similar to you, it sounds like I don't really have a jealous bone in my body. I really enjoy watching other people win and succeed instead of having somebody say, well, like I shouldn't, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that he got that versus being like, dude, that's awesome. Like freaking way to go, man. That's awesome that you, that you hit that base hit deal or whatever it was. Because when you start getting jealousy, you start getting resentment and then you start to get selfish. And that's just like, not a, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy as it goes down. And I just don't ever want to be a person. I would never want to be around a person like that. So I don't want to be that person. So reach out to me. Like I'll put, you know, my email, we'll, we'll put my links in the show yeah, notes and everything yeah, like sure. that and reach out directly. We'll, we'll have a, we'll have a call and see if you're a good fit for our, for our group. It's all action takers. So don't get me wrong. So if you're not an action taker, <laughs> don't sign up because people are rocking and rolling. But awesome. if you are somebody that's interested to learn more, we walk you through handheld, song and dance from start to finish a to b to you buy your first or your fifth deal it's awesome man well i appreciate the time cool. i i feel like we could have spent you know like you said going to cost segs and yes i mean there's a whole slew of other other things on the underwriting side of commercial the different you know things but i like i said i i value so much and there's so many different nuggets of like trying to wrap your brain around um this space and so I appreciate the time, man, and, and we may have to have a follow-up you know, yes, cost yes. egg, uh podcast. I'll so. have to have you on my podcast, then. That's <laughs> yeah, what we can do next. So awesome. we'll, uh, we'll do that. But again, man, thank you for having me. I, I love doing this. And again, reach out anytime. I'd love to help anyway. Sounds good. Cool. Take it easy, Thank boss. you, man.